In the 19th century, um, Manchester established itself as a, as a world leader in, in industry. Goods that were made for, in Manchester, they were shipped via rail down to Liverpool, and from Liverpool they'd be taken on to uh, the rest of the world. Now, the manufacturers and the mill owners of Manchester eventually realised that if if they could bypass the docks at Liverpool and the charges imposed uh, on the movement of their goods, uh, they'd actually be making a huge, there's a huge potential for savings to be had there. So this idea slowly developed of bypassing Liverpool into a, a ship canal that would connect the heart of Manchester Salford, where we are right now, connecting Salford out to the Irish Sea. There, after a lot of struggles, Parliament eventually passed an act and the project was given the go-ahead. Construction on the canal uh, eventually started in 1887 um, and it finished in 1893. At the time it cost £15 million, which is about £1.5 in today's money. So it was a huge project. There were 16,000 navvies working on the project. There was 200 miles of dedicated railway laid, uh, just, just, just again, just for the operation of the canal. 170 trains were used and 6,000 wagons, taking a total of 53 million cubic tons of earth to make way for, for this canal. The, the canal starts at the river estuary. It starts at the river estuary, uh, flows through Cheshire, Lancashire, uh, comes out into here at Salford Docks, where this is, this is considered the end. Upstream of here, it's, it's fed by uh, the River Irwell. The Manchester Canal is not like any other canal. So, for example, you've got the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. Again, that's designed to take goods between the two cities. Whereas this is very different in that, firstly, it's the head of the system is fed directly by a river. It flows out straight into the ocean and it's designed to take deep sea vessels. Once the canal opened, Salford Docks became the third busiest dock. In, uh, in Britain. Now considering that it's, it's 40 miles from the coastline, that's a pretty big achievement and it was a huge boost to the economy in this area. But eventually, with World War I and II particularly, there was a, there was a huge drop in the trade uh, that Manchester, uh, the, the docks here attracted. There was a huge drop in the number of uh, businesses here, manufacturing businesses. Then in the 80s, that was almost a final blow for the canal at the time because the deep sea cargo ships outgrew the canal and the, the restrictions that were based, uh, that were placed on ships um, based on the, the size of the locks. A lot of uh, large cargo ship owners saw this area as a bit of a cul-de-sac um, and there was a lot of effort for them to bring their boat and the risks in associated. So this kind of uh, scared a lot of shipping companies away uh, and that's how the decline uh, came. Today you've got Peel Ports. Peel Ports now own the canal. Uh, they actually own, uh, they actually have a big presence in, in Liverpool uh, at the docks over there as well. So it, it's essentially the two areas that were originally made in competition, in rivalry, now are actually working together. Year by year they've, re, they've raised the, the number of containers and cargoes uh, that are being uh, transported up and down the canal. In, 2000 and in 2009, there was around 9,000 containers being taken, um, being transported along the canal. Uh, that rose to 22,000 in 2013. So uh, Peel Ports have also got ambitious targets in the future. I think for the next, five, uh, for the next 10 to 15 years, uh, they want to see, they want to have 100,000 uh, cargo containers being uh, ferried up and down the canal. That works happens mostly downstream of here, just, just uh, kind of out, out of the city. Upstream, upstream in this region, this area here, the economy shifted um, and into focusing major on redeveloping the area. So in this region, you've got behind us, you've got the Media City, you've got the BBC, ITV, you've got lots of museums, you've got the, the Imperial War Museum over here, and you've got major uh, residential developments that have, uh, have gone up. All of these have had different challenges that would have been faced by uh, the, by the engineers and it would have been a very different challenge to the one faced at the time of construction. If you can imagine this area being completely uh, built up with um, 
large mills, now they've all been flattened. So they've all been flattened and you've got these really heavy high-rise buildings going up. Um, that presents a whole different set of challenges to the engineers and it's the adaption of old assets, new assets and bringing everything together, that's something that really um, attracts me to the industry. That's why I came to engineering and I can imagine bringing a lot more people into engineering for that reason.